Um, today I'm presenting my talk, uh, your practical guide to Docker context. Um, as she said, I'm Carl, I'm a Ops Engineer at ProducerNex and I help with the admin maintenance and development on the Skiver platform, which is our Drupal hosting platform. And um, today I'll be discussing Docker's ecosystem, some problems around uh, the licenses, which changed a few years ago, as we all know, and the implications behind that, and uh, some things that came out of it. And we'll be discussing some Docker desktop alternatives. Um, why discuss this? I, I think it's important to note that such behavior as changing a, a license after you've become uh, dependent on it can be, it, it's not good. And as a result, we've got alternatives to bits of the puzzle that make up Docker and being able to replace those with things that we need to, essentially. It, it builds stability and resilience of Docker and Docker concepts longer term. <coughs> so this talk would be for people to have uh, existing frustrations with Docker or people who want to learn a bit more about how Docker works. We'll be talking about the API uh, feedback loop, how a request is made and authenticated and how we can use that, well, some of those constructs to replace the virtual machine behind Docker Desktop if we wanted to. So uh, questions uh, I'd like everyone to answer or be able to answer. Uh, uh, should I be paying for Docker? First and foremost, uh, licenses can be difficult. This is just to raise awareness of the details. Uh, what alternatives are there? Uh, I'll be discussing three alternatives today and I'll go into some of those features and uh, what they provide. Uh, should we be exploring an alternative? This is subjective to your needs. Docker Desktop is not a bad product. Inherently, it's a good package solution, but it doesn't mean it will fit the bill for everyone. Maybe there's something you're seeking that you can't get from it right now. And lastly, how are the alternatives different? I'll be going into those three alternatives to discuss that. Now, my personal experience coming into this problem was when I was working with Department of Finance and I rebuilt a project um, Amazie was where the custodians of. And that's Pygmy, uh, for those that don't know. We had a, a, a issue that came in where people needed to continue to use it. These are government users, they are dependent on their stacks. And there was a sudden change that uh, they had to move away from Docker Desktop. So that was the scenario. Uh, I had a couple of prototypes to fix that problem, but we ended up resolving in, it in the same way that we'll be looking at today. Now, the Docker, oh, this section, rather, the Docker ecosystem, I'll be covering the product stack, what, what comes in Docker, some issues around what, what people have had issues. Um, we'll go into good Docker context, so we'll discuss what a context is, what it looks like, what it does in the API lifecycle, and then we'll talk about the license itself. So the Docker ecosystem, uh, not everyone is fully aware, but Docker Desktop is just one of the products in its product stack. You have things like the engine, you have Compose, which uh, from next talk, it's a bit of history there. We come from, was it Fig? Yep all the way and now it's actually baked into the Docker CLI. So it, the first version is still a separate product, but its future is embedded in the Docker CLI. There's also a software called Buildkit. That's one I'm trying to look at replacing myself just out of curiosity. Buildkit is the engine behind uh, container builds, essentially. And of course, there's the Kubernetes flavor of Docker and it provides its own defaults and its own opinions. Uh, people have historically, we've seen this on Slack even, uh, Docker have shipped API versions or upgrades that are perhaps too soon or have uh, problems where obviously we, we gather around, we find a solution, but that isn't always um, effective because we need to work on those solutions, we need to sustain them through upgrade cycles 
and need to understand that a bit. Problems around uh, slowness, potentially in Docker, I'm not claiming anything, but th there have been issues in the past. Volume amounts, like how the file system works, the architecture of the laptop or the desktop you're using can play a part in the performance. And uh, yes. <coughs> so lastly, on this slide, um, Docker was made at a time where there wasn't any unified standards around how the software should work. So it, it was very much doing its own thing at the time. And it, like Nick said also, Docker just exploded and uh, it's become the monopoly. Everyone uses it and um, that's where we are now. Kubernetes actually dropped support for uh, Docker officially as part of 120 and 2020. And more recently, they had a, a Docker shim which was providing support for that. Um, again, ironically. But they recently removed that as well. And they've replaced that with container D as their default runtime. So there's a bit of history there. Uh, APL lifecycle, it's, it's a fairly straightforward thing. It's a RESTful API. It will offload all the work to a daemon. And we're going to be exploring one architecture which combines those two, actually. But a user will come into the, the application, the CLI. They'll want to perform an operation, start a container, or maybe they want to pull a container. So the request comes in. It goes through a Docker construct known as a context, which contains network uh, information, as well as a path to a Unix socket, which provides the authentication to the virtual machine. And this is kind of what that looks like. But this one did come from a bare metal system, which is not virtual machine based. Just uh, heads up with that. Um, what this allows us to do is to add, replace, or remove additional contacts if we have the need to. We may have sensitive clients. We may have uh, tech stacks dedicated to a certain product or client. This yeah, effectively allows us to do that and switch between them. Um, the Docker license, this is effectively Docker desktop only. All of the other licenses haven't changed um, as far as I have accounted for. But if you're more than 250 employees, or if you make more than 10 million in gross income, or if you work, uh, if you are part of a government agency, the license states that you're supposed to pay for it. And the problem with this was it wasn't upfront when a lot of people made the investment to move into Docker. And I'm running out of time. I'll leave it. Um, alternatives. I wanted to discuss Podman, Orbstack, and Columnar, three, I guess, favorable options in the community. The first one is Orbstack. Uh, it's, it's built to be Apple Silicon uh, first. It is fast and light, and it's also a paid product, but it's fairly upfront about that. The downside to this one is it's non-permissive license. If you want to know what the experience of that one looks like, it's it really rather pretty. Here it is. Uh, Coloma, it's another community favorite. I've seen it pop up many times. I personally haven't had a lot of luck with it, but it is extremely customizable. And um, it, it provides quite a lot. It's free and open source. But the downside to this one is it doesn't have a UI. Some interesting stats on perhaps performance on the file systems, Columnar versus Docker Desktop. What I'm doing here is just showing that if you want to seek differences and improvements in your workflow, there are options for you. I, I'm definitely not trying to say anything about Docker Desktop because it is so cohesive and complete. But if you want, there are options. Lastly, uh, Podman. Podman is a Red Hat built product. They are built and maintained by them. It's open source, a uh, very active community. What Podman does is it's focused on, on security, lots of security features. And it also allows a user to remove Docker completely from their system. Like for like, you probably wouldn't notice it from the CLI if you were to alias your uh, Podman to Bash. It includes things like Compose, 
and even rootless containers. If you have a laptop that's stolen, the attack vector could not be through container escape strategies. Daemonless architecture will couple the API to the, run, uh, the uh, daemon, it, which provides a more security focused product. Uh, the last point I would like to make about this is the SC Linux uh, support. SC Linux was a technology that was built by NSA. It was made to control what a Linux process is allowed to do or not allowed to do. And it was handed over because they don't want to maintain the longer term. They wanted the capacity, obviously, but it is open source now. And this is both defaulted and customizable. It's really flexible. And it, you find this technology in Kubernetes fairly often as well. And here's what Podman desktop looks like. As you can see, there's a, a few different integrations and looks pretty nice. Here's a quick comparison. I'll leave it up for a moment, but uh, it just tries to narrow the focus of each of them. So Columnar is focused on configurability as well as uh, rootless containers. OrbStack is an experience focused product, which is focused on I guess you could say it's speed, time to 200. It's really focused on user experience and lightweightness. Podman, security, and if I had a high point for Docker Desktop, I would say it's a cohesive and complete product. Uh, what should you do? It's a good question. Um, everyone's case is different. You may have a necessity to move away from Docker Desktop. You may have an interest in increasing your security um, yeah, perimeter. What I would do in this case is I would look at each piece of the puzzle and try to see if I could break it apart completely. Where we have an ecosystem of products coming out now which, which do exactly this because of the license change. It spawned a whole heap of puzzle pieces and we are now in a place where we can pick and choose each of those. Yeah. So, yeah. Any questions?